Our third and second to last penultimate unit that we're going to do this year is called uniform circular motion. Let me define this first, and then we'll talk about a couple of terms that we've heard before, we've seen before in some, somewhere, but not necessarily in the context of physics. Um, circular motion, I think that's pretty intuitive, an object moving in a circle, right? But what do we mean exactly by uniform circular motion? Well, uniform circular motion involves an object moving in a circle at a constant speed. There are clearly situations where we have an object moving in a circle, and it's not uniform circular motion. The object is speeding up or slowing down as it goes around the circle. But we're going to focus over the next few weeks on objects moving in a circle while they're moving at a constant speed. Now, in order to do that, we have to define two new terms for us, and then talk a little bit more about one term, the third term that you see on the board here, speed, that obviously we've already addressed in Physics 20. First one, frequency. That's new to you in the context of physics, although you have seen it before somewhere, someplace, sometime. Does anybody have an idea as to what frequency might mean, maybe in the context of physics? Where have you seen it before? Where have you heard frequency before? The frequency of something, or... What do you think of when you see that word frequency, even if it's not a physics thing? Have you ever heard it? Yes? How frequently have you heard it? What's the frequency at which you've heard this word before? Okay, so how often something happens? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of a qualitative definition of it, and that's good. Um, a numerical definition of it, or a, or a quantitative, I should say, definition of it, would be, um, we would say the number of cycles, or in this case, the number of revolutions, number of rotations per second. We'll say the number of cycles, because one cycle of an object going in a circle would be a revolution. We're going to talk about it in slightly more general terms in our next unit, so we'll leave it as cycles here. The number of cycles per second, the amount of cycles per unit time. Now, uh, if we're going to define frequency this way, uh, we can write down a little equation that goes with that definition. If it's the number of cycles per second, we're just simply going to say frequency is number of cycles over the amount of time. Right? Ten cycles over two seconds would give me five cycles per second. Now, the units that go along with frequency would be, well, we could say cycles per second, right? Anybody know another unit that means the same thing as a cycle per second? Joseph has his hand up right now. I saw Nathan with his hand up a second ago. Boy, it hurts me that only two of you know what the uh, units would be, the other set of units would be for cycles per second. It really hurts me that only two of you know this. Really hurts me that only two of you know the units that mean cycle per second. Nathan, what would it be? Hey, very good. Hurts. We abbreviate that as an H said. So one cycle per second, one revolution per second, one rotation per second would be one hertz. The period is, if frequency is the number of cycles per second, the period would be essentially the inverse of that. It would be the time per cycle, not cycles per time but time per cycle. Usually it's in seconds as well. Period is given by a capital T. Be careful with that. Okay, we don't want to make this a lowercase t. Lowercase t is time, but it represents any time. Okay, it could be the time that it takes for one cycle. It could be the time that it takes for the car to go to Calgary. It could be the time that it takes for you to run around the track once. It could be the time that it takes for uh, a radio wave to come from the aliens in outer space down to, down to our classroom here. Okay, it could be any time. Big T represents a very specific time. It's specifically the time for one cycle or the time for one revolution in the context of circular motion. Now, if we're going to write that as an equation, it's going to be just flipped over from the, 
the frequency. It's the time over the number of cycles. Now, the units that would go along with period would be seconds. You could actually say seconds per revolution or seconds per cycle, but usually we're just going to say seconds. And there's no other unit that we say is the same thing as seconds like there was for frequency. Cycles per second is a hertz, um, but a second is just a second. Now, period can be measured in hours or days or even years as well, but usually it's going to be measured in seconds. The standard unit is going to be seconds. Finally, speed. We know what speed is. I'm not even going to define that for you, but I will give you an equation that represents speed. Okay, first one that you learned this year. V is equal to delta D over delta T. But I'm going to modify it a little bit. I'm going to modify this equation just a little bit here now. Because we're talking about uniform circular motion, where the object is going at a constant speed around the circle, we're allowed to use this equation. But we're going to replace in, or we're going to sub in, something for delta D. The distance that, that an object travels as it goes around the circle once is called the what? What property of the circle is that? Yep, circumference. Now, the circumference of a circle is given by the equation 2 pi r, or some of you might say pi times d, right? twice times pi times the, the radius, or just simply pi times the diameter. This is the way I'll write it, but if you write it pi times diameter, that's fine too. If the distance around the circle once is the circumference, the time around the circle once is what? We just talked about it. The time that it takes to go around the circle once is the, the period. So we're going to say here now that the speed of an object specifically undergoing uniform circular motion is 2 pi r, that's the circumference of the circle, divided by period, the time that it takes to go around the circle one time. One more thing. One more thing on this page. We got an equation for frequency, which, by the way, doesn't appear on your data sheet because it's really just a definition, right? We got an equation for period, which doesn't appear on your data sheet because it's really just a definition. We have an equation for speed, which does appear on your data sheet. The final thing that we have is something that's going to combine a couple of these equations. Okay, something that's going to combine a couple of these terms or find the relationship between two of them. Frequency and period, if you look at the equations, look real similar, but backwards, flipped over. So what we're going to say now is that the period is equal to frequency is cycles per time, period is time per cycles. The period would be 1 over the frequency, the inverse of the frequency. So if you've got the frequency, flip it over to get the period. Similarly, if you've got the period, you could flip it over to get the frequency. This one appears on your data sheet as well, t is equal to 1 over f. Because it's not a definition, right? It's a real equation as opposed to a definition like these two. We've got a few relatively straightforward questions to work on today. I'm going to give you one of them right now. First one says, 5.1 on page 250, says, the hard drive on a computer, it's, this is actually referring to a diagram that's in your textbook or a picture that's in your textbook, but we don't really need that picture. In the end, all the data is given to us here. It says, the hard drive stores data on this computer, stores data on a thin magnetic platter that spins at a high speed. The platter makes one complete revolution in 0 0.00833 seconds. Determine its frequency in hertz and in RPMs. What would RPM stand for, by the way? What is it? Somebody said it? Yeah, rotations per minute or revolutions per minute. Good. Um, this is pretty accurate, by the way. Okay, the hard drive of a computer could actually spin around once in eight one thousandths of a second. It spins around very, very quickly. Now, some hard drives could spin faster. Okay, the faster it spins, the quicker the access to the data that you have. Right? If you have data stored on this hard drive and it's spinning around faster, then, of course, your access to that is going to be quicker the faster it spins. Okay? Um, the faster it spins, the more you pay for your hard drive, though, right? Because quick access. Let's determine what this frequency is. Uh, what do we got here given to us? Okay, something 0 0.00833 seconds. We said that's the time that it takes to complete one revolution. What variable is that? 
We've only learned three, right? Frequency, period, and speed. What do we got there? Sam? Okay. okay. What do we got there? What is it? Frequency, period, or speed? Again? Period. It's the time for one complete revolution, the time for one complete cycle. It's the period. Now, we want to find the frequency. Uh, we won't worry about the units right now. Let's just worry about how to find it. Period was time per revolution. Frequency was number of revolutions per time. And speed was circumference over time, circumference over, over period. Uh, frequency was also 1 over the period. What are we going to use? Which one of those several equations that we just did are we going to use to find frequency here? T is equal to the inverse of the frequency? Yeah. Okay, we want to find frequency, so let's rearrange it. Okay, the F goes up, the T goes down, it becomes 1 over the period. So 1 over 0 0.00833 seconds. It's going to give us what? I believe that works out to be something like 7,200. Somebody figure that out, though? Yes, I'm off because I'm thinking of I'm thinking of different units here. So what do you get? Thank you. 112.612. That would be hertz, right? Cycles per second or revolutions per second. We're going to round that to uh, what? 113 hertz. It's pretty quick, right? Think about that. You get this little component in your, in your computer. It's spinning around all the time. As you're using your computer, it's spinning around at 113 revolutions per second. Is that right? Divided by 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0. Oh, see. Oh, 120. Even more. What did you get there, Nathan? 120 point. What is it? 048. Uh, hertz, which is going to round to exactly 120 hertz. All right. So 120 revolutions per second. It spins around 120 times in one second. All right. We want to find the frequency in revolutions per minute now. Any ideas of what we're going to do here? Revolutions per second. Revolutions per minute would be, what's the conversion between minutes and seconds? You guys know this. How many seconds in a minute? You better know this. If we have 60 seconds in a minute, what are we going to do here? Multiply or divide. If you're anything like me and you come to a conversion like this, you're not going to be very good at it. Because I'm not very good at these conversions. Okay, I can do this. I know whether to multiply or divide. But I've seen this a million times before. If I'm looking at this for the first time, I'd be like, oh, Jesus. I, I know it's 60. I don't know whether it's multiply by 60 or divide by 60. Like, what do I do? Multiply by 60 or divide by 60? Well, you're smart enough to multiply by 60. You know what I'm smart enough to do? If I don't know what to do, I, I guess. That's what I'm smart enough to do, I guess. So, you know what, let's, let's actually guess Julie, the other one. Let's, let's guess that we have to divide by 60, okay? And then we'll go back to yours. So, oops, that's not 60, that's 2. Let's divide by 60, and what do we get? 2, right? That's going to be 2 revolutions per minute. Is that right? No, it doesn't seem right, does it? Okay, here's the thing. If you're going to guess like I just did, then you better check your guess. If it makes 120 revolutions in one second, that sounds like a lot. Right? It spins really, really fast. Is it going to only make two revolutions in a whole minute? Of course not. Of course it's going to make more revolutions in a minute than it is a second. So let's go back to Julia's. She didn't even really guess. She was smart enough to know this. But let's go back to Julia's answer and say, oh, it's multiplied by 60. What do we end up getting? 7,200 or 7.20 times 10 to the 3. That sounds better, right? Okay, we get 7,200 revolutions in a minute. We got 120 revolutions in a second. Well, they both seem pretty high, right? Remember when I was, 
when I was given the answer for this before you guys gave me an answer, I said I thought it was 7,200. Why did I think it was 7,200? Not because I actually remembered the answer to this, but because, because I remember that a, a pretty common frequency for hard drives is actually 7,200. When you see ads at Best Buy or Future Shop or whatever the case may be, sometimes they'll tell you the frequency of the hard drive. 7,200 RPM is pretty common. Okay, sometimes it can be bigger, but again, the bigger it is, the more you pay for it as well. Is that okay? Easy enough to start out, right? I think the hardest thing here is that conversion, but hey, if, you're, if you have to guess like I do, then guess. Just make sure you check your guess to see if it's reasonable. All right, let's take a look at those three questions that we see on page 250, please. All right, if those, two are, those three questions are okay, let's take a look at another question on 251. It says, a pebble is stuck in the treads of a tire at a distance of 36 centimeters from the axle. It takes just 0.4 seconds for the wheel to make one revolution. What's the speed of the pebble at any instant? Not the frequency, not the period, but the speed. Well, we don't really need the diagram there because I think we can draw our own picture if we really need a picture. Um, in the end, you might be able to just look at this and write down the givens uh, without any picture. We have uh, a radius here of, of 36 centimeters, which probably want to draw attention to that because we want to convert it to meters. But if the treads of the tire are that far from the axle, then the rotation point is 36 centimeters away from the rock, which is, of course is the radius of the circle. Uh, we get something here, 0 0.40 seconds. What's that going to be? What variable is that? Yep. It's the period. It's the time for one complete revolution, and we want to find the speed. Now, we know the speed is d over t, but specifically for uniform circular motion, the speed is 2 pi r over t, or you could say pi times the diameter over the time, over the period. 2 times pi times 0 0.360 divided by 0 0.40 seconds is equal to 5.6, two digits, right? Because this goes back to three digits, two digits. Final answer should be two digits. 5.6 meters per second. So how fast is this rock moving on the outside? 5.6 meters per second. If the force that was keeping it going in a circle was to suddenly disappear, it would fly off in a straight line at 5.6 meters per second. Right? Hey, you read this question, um, you know, about the, uh, the rock stuck, on the, stuck in the tire going around, making one complete revolution in 0 0.4 seconds. And this actually reminds me of uh, a real similar question to this, actually. Um, completely different scale, but real similar in terms of nature here. Um, we're standing on the Earth right now. The Earth is rotating on its axis right now. It's rotating pretty quick. You ever wonder how fast we're actually moving right now? Isn't that kind of the same question? How fast is the rock moving on the outside of the tire? How fast are we moving on the outside of the Earth? We're going to do exactly the same thing, right? For us rotating on the outside of the Earth at a constant speed, it's 2 times pi times the radius of the Earth, which I believe is 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. But I'm going to ask you to check your data sheet for that one. Gavin, the radius of the Earth? 6.38 times 10 to the 6. Thank you. Divided by 008, the period. What's the period? What's the period of the Earth's rotation? We know this, right? Yeah? 24 hours. It takes 24 hours for the Earth to rotate once on its axis. Let's figure out what that is in seconds. Okay, by multiplying by 60 to get minutes, and then multiplying by 60 again to get seconds. Thank you. 86,400 seconds. Now let's calculate the speed. Before you do, before you do calculate the speed, I want you to think in your mind uh, kind of an estimate as to what you think it's going to be. Not looking at those numbers, but just, oh, geez, I think we're going pretty slow, you know, 8 meters per second. Or I think we're going pretty fast, 10 million kilometers per hour. In your mind, come up with a kind of a guess as to what that's going to be, and then calculate it and see what we actually get there. Nine seven. Okay, four hundred and sixty-three point nine seven. What are the units? 
No, it's speed, so it's meters per second. 464 meters per second. So we travel right now, as I speak to you, we are all traveling four and a half football fields per second. We are all traveling almost Mach 1.5 right now. All of us. Yeah, it's pretty fast. We're moving pretty fast. Why don't we notice that? Why don't we notice that we're traveling that fast? Yeah, because we're not changing speed, right? If we all of a sudden slow down, we'd notice it. Or if we all of a sudden sped up, we'd notice it. But as long as we're traveling at a constant speed, hey, it's the same thing as being at rest as far as physiological reaction to that, at least. We, don't, we have no idea. Traveling in an elevator upwards doesn't feel like it, does it? Unless you're accelerating upwards, changing speed going upwards, right? So same question, obviously completely different scale there. Have a look at those two questions, please, on speech 51 that go along with that example. All right, let's take a look at number two. It says, in 2006, an Alberta astronomer discovered the fastest spinning collapsed star ever found. It's got a radius of only 16.1 kilometers. That sounds like a big distance, but when you're talking about the radius of a star, 16.1 kilometers is ridiculously small, right? Like, like that's the distance between here and not even to Calgary, right? 16.1 kilometers. Spinning at a rate of 716 hertz, which is faster than a kitchen blender. What's the speed at the equator? So you happen to be standing on the surface of this star. How fast are you going to be spinning around? 400 meters per second like you are on the Earth? Not quite. We've got a radius here of 16.1 kilometers, which we're going to make 16,100 meters. Right? We multiply by 1,000. We get a frequency here of 716 hertz. We want to find the speed. We know that V is equal to 2 pi r over t, but I don't know what t is. So how do I find it? Now we're kind of combining a question we just did a minute ago along with something we did earlier on. We have to find the period by saying t is equal to 1 over f. So let's say 1 over 716 gives me something. And then let's say 2 times pi times 16,100 divided by that something gives me the speed. And when I do that, I get 7.24 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. This is, you think we're going fast on Earth, 400 and whatever meters per second? This is ridiculously fast. That's 10 to the 2. This is 10 to the 7. Okay, that's 100,000 times faster, about, than we're traveling on the surface of the Earth. And this is approaching the speed of light. It's so fast. Is that good? Yep. Okay, just a little bit more to cover here, guys, and then we'll wrap it up for the day. Uh, two more terms. Go along with uh, uniform circular motion. Just a reminder again, uniform circular motion, object traveling at a constant speed around a circle. How do we have an acceleration, though? How can we talk about an acceleration if the speed of the object is going, is constant? Yep. Yeah. Acceleration is not the rate of change of speed. It's the rate of change of velocity. Now, the speed is staying the same as you go around a circle on the surface of the Earth or on the surface of that uh, pulsar, whatever. But the velocity isn't because velocity includes direction. So if the velocity is changing, then the acceleration, then there is an acceleration. That acceleration is what we call a centripetal acceleration. The centripetal acceleration is the acceleration that acts toward the center of the circle. Centripetal means toward the center, center seeking. So an acceleration toward the center of the circle. That doesn't make sense, does it? An acceleration toward the center of the circle. How can the velocity be changing toward the center of the circle? Well, let's define centripetal force, and then we'll go back to defining how we can say how, how the acceleration can be toward the center of the circle here. Centripetal force would be the force that acts.
toward the center of the circle. Again, the word centripetal means center seeking or toward the center. This one's a little bit easier to understand. If I take my keys on the end of the rope here, they're under the string, and I swing them around, these keys want to go in a straight line. Everything wants to go in a straight line. That's the law of inertia, Newton's first law. If there's no unbalanced force, they'll go in a straight line every single time at a constant speed. There clearly must be an unbalanced force to keep them from going in a straight line. What's supplying that unbalanced force? Forget about what it's called. Forget about the word centripetal here. What causes the unbalanced force? What's pulling on these keys? What's keeping them from going in a straight line? Simple answer here. Yeah, my hand. It's my hand. My hand is pulling on the string, which is pulling on the keys, right? My hand supplies that force that keeps them from going in a straight line. As long as my hand pulls on these keys, they're not going in a straight line. If I let go of these keys all of a sudden, then they are going to go in a straight line. They're going to fly off in a straight line. Where is my hand relative to these keys? If these keys are going in a circle, my hand is at the center of the circle. Therefore, the force that my hand is applying is toward the center of the circle. The force that acts toward the center of the circle. A center-seeking force, a centripetal force. Now, we learned in physics... 20 earlier on, that F is equal to M times A. Or A is equal to F over M. If the force is toward the center of the circle, then which way is the acceleration? Toward the center of the circle. So we have a centripetal acceleration, and we have a centripetal force. Does that make sense? Good? All right. We're going to describe now the centripetal acceleration by an equation. We're going to say that centripetal acceleration, the magnitude of it at least, because the equation that I'm about to show you won't give us the direction, only the value, only the magnitude. Hey, but that's okay, because in the end, we know the direction already. It's toward the center. We don't need an equation to tell us what direction that, that acceleration is pointing. We know it's toward the center of the circle. It's going to be equal to V squared over R. What's V stand for? What's V stand for? Yeah. Speed. Not the velocity. The velocity is changing. In uniform circular motion, the speed stays the same. So it's V squared over R. The units that would go along with that, you can probably figure this out yourself, meters per second squared. The centripetal force, well, a force is M times A. But the acceleration is the centripetal acceleration. So in this case, the centripetal force becomes m times a, which is v squared over r. The units for that, of course, would be newtons. Once again, absolute value sign around it because the equation is not going to tell me the direction. But that's OK, because we already know the direction is toward the center. We're going to talk more about this uh, in the next couple of days. But I'm just going to real quickly um, do one more little thing with you to help you to understand, perhaps, why the force and the acceleration is toward the center of the circle. Hey, let's say that I'm sitting in my car at a stop sign. And let's say I put my foot on the gas pedal. Uh, really, really quick. I accelerate really quickly. Or maybe somebody hits me from behind. Or maybe I'm on an airplane. You're taxiing out at a constant speed. You turn that corner onto the one way, and then they give her. Right? They give it from you know, 50 kilometers per hour to 300 kilometers per hour in a matter of a couple seconds. What happens to you? What happens to you in each of those cases? You're hit from behind at a stop sign, or you put your foot on the accelerator really, really quickly, or the airplane accelerates on the runway really, really quickly. What happens to you? You get pushed back into your seat? No, you don't actually get pushed back into your seat. Yeah, the seat pushes forward, right? But it feels like, Nathan, that you get pushed back into your seat, doesn't it? 
whenever you have an acceleration, whether it's at a stop sign because you go forward because you just drive forward, or whether you're hit from behind at a stop sign, whether you're on the runway of an airport of, of an airport, whenever you have an acceleration, you feel like you're being pushed the opposite way. Think about that. Okay? You accelerate forward, you feel like you're being pushed back into your seat. Right? Let's say you come to a crashing stop. You slam on your brake. You feel like you're being pushed forward. Which way was the force? Backwards. Whenever there's a force, whenever there's an acceleration, you feel like you're being pushed the opposite way. When you're going around a turn, Maybe you're, there's seven of you in the back seat of your little 1973 Datsun. You go around the, the uh, turn on the off-ramp coming from Highway 2 on, into uh, Highway 2A in Okotoks here at 112 kilometers per hour. Which way do you feel like you're being pushed? To the outside, right? You ever notice that? You feel like you're being pushed to the outside of the circle? Well, if you feel like you're being pushed to the outside, which way does the acceleration have to be? To the inside, towards the center. Right? If you feel like you're being pushed back into your seat when you're accelerating forward, when you feel like you're being pushed forward when you're accelerating backward, then when you feel like you're being pushed to the outside of the circle, you're really being pushed to the inside of the circle. Hence, centripetal force, centripetal acceleration. Yeah, question? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, no, hold on, though, hold on. Okay, you're, you're having a little trouble with, with Newton's third law there. Remember we do a diagram on Newton's third law, and I said, here's the common misconception with Newton's third law. Okay, you're not the only one to have that issue. I promise you that. I guarantee you there's people that teach, that teach Physics 20 in this province that have the exact same issue as you. I guarantee it. You guys aren't going to have that issue, though, at least by the end of the year. Nathan said, if you're, if you're pushing on the seat, then aren't you, by Newton's third law, pushing back on the, on the seat? Yeah, you, that's true. You are. Okay, but you're misunderstanding the bigger picture here. The bigger picture is what direction is the force on you? It's, it's pushing you forward, right? Does that make sense? Now, you feel like you're being pushed backwards. You are pushing the seat backwards. Legitimately, you're pushing the seat backwards. But you're not legitimately being pushed backwards. Does that make sense? Two objects here, right? It pushes on you. You push on it. It's pushing on you forward. That doesn't mean an equal and opposite force pushes you backwards. It just feels like you get pushed backwards. Okay? Now, we alluded to this a few times here. The motion of an object undergoing uniform circular motion, we just abbreviate it with UCM, at any point is a straight line at a tangent to the circle. When I was your age, 16 years old, I got a job at a dry cleaner's. You got to drive a delivery van for a dry cleaner. It was the best job in the world for a 16-year-old. Loved to drive. Loved to drive. So I got a job driving Saturdays, and then it, as in the summer times, it went to six days a week. Um, I would drive eh, about, my, my route, depending on the day, would be somewhere around 400 kilometers a day. That would make my route. So in the summertime, I'd be driving like almost 3,000 kilometers a week. It was great for a 16-year-old. I loved to drive. It was a great job. But I remember one day in the winter time when I just did my one day a uh, one day uh, a week route. It had snowed. The road was kind of slushy. It wasn't too bad, but I was a new driver, inexperienced. So I'm coming off the highway, going down onto the on-ramp. Did I tell you this? Going on to the on ramp and what happens, or the off ramp, what happens? I hit a patch of ice. And what happens when I hit a patch of ice? Go off in a straight line. We must have talked, I don't remember telling you this, but we must have talked about it when we talked about Newton's first law, right? Well, when I'm going around a turn, okay, this is the turn that I'm supposed to go around at this, in this direction. At this moment in time, my velocity is this way. At this moment in time, it's this way. At this moment in time, it's this way. 
your velocity is at any given moment is always a straight line. It's just a centripetal force that keeps you from continuing to go in a straight line. As soon as I remove that centripetal force, what happens? I go off in a straight line. If the patch of ice is right here, then I go off this way. If the patch of ice is right here, then I go off this way. Some people think, oh, if I hit a patch of ice right here, I go off this way. No, I don't. I feel like I'm going to the outside of the circle as I'm going around the turn, right? But I'm not. I'm really accelerating toward the inside. My acceleration is this way. My velocity is this way. My acceleration is toward the center. My velocity is a tangent to the circle. Does that make sense? All right, we'll wrap it up there for today, guys.